so we declare the praises of Jesus, Savior, and King. Good evening, and welcome to the 2023 Clang Valley Bible Conference. Uh, my name is Andrew, and on behalf of all the uh, KVBC and Equip Ministries, I want to welcome all of you here tonight. Uh, it's a great privilege and joy to be able to uh, gather together again uh, in person uh, after the pandemic. Uh, so it's lovely to be here. We come together as people who trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. We believe that He died for our sins in our place, and He rose again as the Lord of all. We've been given His Holy Spirit, so we know Him as our Lord, and through Him we know God as our Father. And because Jesus is our Lord, we sit under His authority, and therefore the authority of the Scriptures, which He so clearly authenticated as the Word of God. And so tonight we gather as one people around God's Word to listen to Him and to respond to Him in love and obedience. Let's begin in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have gathered us together tonight around your word. And we pray that you'll be speaking to us by your spirit through your word tonight as it is read and preached. And may your spirit strengthen our preacher to teach your word faithfully. And may he be working in each of our hearts through that word to be pointing us to Jesus, that we might give our lives to love and worship him. And we ask this for the glory of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. It is our privilege to have the Reverend Dr. Richard Pratt as our speaker for the Clang Valley Bible Conference this year. Uh, Dr. Pratt is a theologian. Uh, he's the founder and president of Third Millennium Ministries, which helps the worldwide church with biblical and theological training so that Christian leaders across the world can have the opportunity to learn the scriptures in their own language and at no cost. Dr. Pratt is the author of a number of books and commentaries, uh, including a commentary on uh, First and Second Chronicles. He's also contributed to a Bible translation and a study Bible. His doctorate is from Harvard, but he's also studied at Westminster and Union Theological Seminaries and has taught for many years at Reformed Theological Seminary. Uh, so please join me in welcoming our speaker for tonight, the Reverend Dr. Richard Pratt. Uh, Richard, thank you for uh, coming to Malaysia. Uh, thank you for being willing to come and, uh, and speak to us tonight. He's not on. Now? Okay. Terima kasih banyak. You work with Third Millennial Ministries. Tomorrow night, I'm going to ask you more about Third Millennium. Mm -hmm. Uh, but tonight I want to ask you a little bit about yourself. So can you tell us a bit about yourself and your background, particularly your family? Um. Okay. Um, hi, everybody. Hi, everyone. I, I, I am married to... Are we good? We'll wait. We'll give it a chance. Okay, that's better. Good, great. I am married to one wife... Um, it's a good and, start. And that's right. And by, God's, <laughs> and by God's mercy, we just celebrated our 50th wedding anniversary. There you go. Of course, you can tell that we got married when we were 10 years old. <laughs> Is that the kind of information you want? Okay. And uh, we have one, one wonderful daughter. Truth and will be helpful. Okay, yeah. Truth will help. Um, 50 years apart is true. Um, we have one wonderful daughter and three lovely grandchildren. And we used to have a dog, but she passed away. But that's okay. There. Heartbreaking. But uh, yeah, that's, that's my family. And we live in Orlando, Florida. Mickey Mouse is my neighbor. And um, yeah, so it's good. It's good. Life is good there. Good. Now, you're going to be preaching over these next three days about uh, building God's kingdom after the exile. Mm -hmm. uh, so tell us, how did you come to be part of God's kingdom and have Jesus as your king? Oh, good question. These are surprise questions. I don't know what he's going to ask, but that's a great one. Uh, 
I became a follower of Jesus when I was 17. And prior to that, I was um, a rebel and someone who was um, very determined not to go to the war that America had in Vietnam. So I know lots of you are too young to know that there was this war that America had in Vietnam, okay? <laughs> Talking to this group right here, okay? Okay. And it wasn't a pleasant thing. And I did not want to go, and I refused to go, and I became very strongly committed. You won't believe this, but it's true. I became very strongly committed to Maoism. Okay. I actually had a Viet Cong flag that I would drape over my shoulder every day. And... One day some hippies, I was a hippie type, and uh, one day these hippies came and they were handing out little leaflets. I thought it was an invitation to a war rally, but it was actually an invitation to a Christian commune. And I went there that night, not exactly knowing what would happen. I had gone to church as a child, but as I was there, these people were talking and speaking about Jesus in a strange way to me. They were talking of him as if they knew him. I knew a lot about him, but they were talking like they were speaking if they knew him. Okay? Okay, so the time came at the end to have a prayer, and in hippie style, we sat on the floor in lotus position, and we went around the room, and each person was going to say just a little prayer, and as it came closer and closer to me, I didn't know what to say. It came closer and closer to me, I still didn't know what to say. And finally, when it became my turn, the only thing that came to my lips were these. I said, Jesus, I want to know you like these people do. And he said, okay, are you ready for this? And I was turned inside out on that night. And so that was at the age of 17. Tell us a bit about your growth since then as a Christian. Well, it was one happy, honey, fantastic, no problem life ever since. Oh, okay. That's fine, thank you. Um. <laughs> what do you want me to say? Um, uh, you know, every, every person who follows Christ in this room tonight knows that the Christian life is a series of ups and downs, and I've had a lot of those. But um, I, was a, I was a student for a while and then became a pastor and did, planted a church for four years, then went off to seminary, and um, then went off to graduate school and working in the church all along in different positions, and then finally became a boring professor in a seminary. It's easy to do. And, um, and it was, a, no, actually it was a wonderful, wonderful gift to be able to do that for about 23 years. And I was a professor of irrelevance. That's the way I would describe myself to new students. And I would say, what department do you think I'm in? And they would either say church history or they would say Old Testament, right? Okay, so I was the professor of Old Testament and it was my job to help them understand that the Old Testament actually is relevant for Christian living and for preaching. And uh, so we did that for 23 years until after traveling a lot around the world, I became aware that where the church is growing the fastest, there's the least opportunity for Christian leaders to learn the Bible. And so that's why I left seminary and, yeah, began to work at Third Mill. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, working with Third Mill, I imagine, would involve a lot of extensive travel uh, all across the world. It has. Uh, and uh, so how do you remain anchored in Christian fellowship um, when you have to travel so much? I guess I should have checked these questions out before, huh? <laughs> I said, nah, surprise me, surprise me. Well, that is a, that is a problem. It, it actually is. When you travel a lot, um, you, you're like a, um, yeah, you're like, if you use a military analogy, I am out on the field a lot. And so it does make a difference. But my main fellowship group is actually the friends we have, the brothers and sisters we have at Third Mill. Uh, I have very close friends, lifelong friends. Most of us have been together for 15 to 20 years. And uh, so my wife and I find our fellowship primarily there, though we are members of a church and we go and she goes regularly, but I go when I'm there. And then she'll travel with me some too. So 
That's the basic way we do it, but it's not ideal or not normal. Actually, it is ideal for us. It's just not normal. It's just not the way people usually do it. I wouldn't recommend it to anyone. I mean, could you say that the Apostle Paul had a normal church experience? No, he didn't. No, probably no. not. Okay. okay, not that I'm an apostle, but he traveled a lot, yeah. and, and I do too, yeah. Good. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Today's uh, Bible reading is from First Chronicles chapter 29, verse 1 to 22. I'm reading from the ESV version. Verse 1. And David the king said to all the assembly, Solomon, my son, whom alone God has chosen, is young and inexperienced, and the work is great. For the palace will not be for man, but for the Lord God. So I have provided for the house of my God, so far as I was able, the gold of the things of gold, the silver of the things of silver, and the bronze of the things of bronze the iron for the things of iron, and the wood for the things of wood, besides great quantities of oxides and stones for settings, antimony, colored stones, and all sorts of precious stones and marble. Moreover, in addition to all that I have provided for the holy house, I have a treasure of my own gold and silver. Because of my devotion to the house of God, I give it to the house of my God, 3,000 talents of gold, of the goals of Ophir, and 7,000 talents of refined silver for all laying the walls of the house, and for all the works to be done by the craftsmen, gold for the things of gold, and silver for the things of silver. Who then will offer willingly, consecrating himself today to the Lord? Verse 6. Then the leaders of the Father's house made their free will offerings, as did also the leaders of the tribes, the commanders of thousands of and of hundreds, and the officers of the king's word. work. Sorry. They gave the service of the house of God 5,000 talents, 10, 10, 5, talents and 10,000 talents of gold, 10,000 talents of silver, 18,000 talents of bronze, and 100,000 100, talents of iron. And whoever had precious stones gave them to the treasury of the house of the Lord, in the case of Jehiel the Jezreelite. Then the people rejoiced because they had given willingly, for with a whole heart they had offered freely to the Lord. David the king also rejoiced greatly. Verse 10. Therefore David blessed the Lord in, in the presence of all the assembly. And David said, Blessed are you, O Lord, the God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in heavens and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. Both riches and honor come from you, and you rule over all. In your hands are power and might, and in your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. And now we thank you, o our God, and praise your glorious name. Verse 14, But who am I and what is my people that we should be able thus to offer willingly? For all things come from you and of your own have we given you. For we are strangers before you and sojourners as all our fathers were. Our days on the earth are like a shadow, and there is no abiding. Our Lord, our God, all this abundance that we have provided for building you a house for your holy name comes from your hand and is all your own. I know, my God, that you test the heart and have the pleasure of pleasure in uprightness. In the uprightness of my heart, I have freely offered all these things, and now I have seen your people who are present here, offering freely and joyously to you. O Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, our fathers, keep forever such purposes and thoughts in the hearts of your people and direct their heart towards you. Grant to Solomon, my son, a whole heart that he may keep your commandments, your testimonies, your statutes, 
performing all, and that he may build the palace for which I have made provision. Verse 20, Then David said to all the assembly, Bless the Lord your God, and all the assembly blessed the Lord, the God of your, their father, and bowed their head and paid homage to the Lord and to the king. And they offered sacrifices to the Lord, and on the next day offered burnt offerings to the Lord, 1,000 bulls, 1,000 rams, and 1,000 lambs with their drink offerings, and sacrifices in abundance for all Israel. And they ate and, they, and drank before the Lord on that day with great gladness. And they made Solomon the son of David king the second time, and they anointed him as the prince for the Lord and Zadok as priest. Amen. Thank you all very much for coming out tonight and especially for not walking out after hearing that very long passage of scripture <laughs> with all the thousands of this and the thousands of that. And I'm sure that everyone in the room agrees with me that the very best book in the Bible is First and Second Chronicles. <laughs> Amen. In fact, the re probably the reason you think it's the best one is because when you've gone on the annual Read the Bible in One Year project, and you've read Kings, and First Kings and Second Kings, and then you get to First and Second Chronicles, you go, oh, I get a break. I can take two days off because this just repeats what was in Kings. Isn't that the way you feel sometimes? Just admit it. It's okay. Well, I'm here to tell you that Chronicles actually is my favorite book in the Bible, uh, and it doesn't simply repeat what you find in the books of 1st and 2nd Kings, but rather it's a book that was written at a very crucial time in the history of Israel, and it describes things, as in this case, in the life of someone that we've all heard of, King David, but it does this for people who are very close, the closest of all in the Bible of the Old Testament, close to you and me. This is the book that is the most Christian book in the whole Old Testament, believe it or not. And if you can take the time in your life to get into it and to try to understand how true that is, you'll find many blessings in reading and studying this part of God's Word. Now, this week, we have three evenings together and we're not going to try to cover the whole book of Chronicles. What we're going to try to do is just parachute in to some key passages that I hope will be encouraging to you where you are today. My goal tonight is to encourage you to faithfulness and love for Jesus because of what we just read. That's my goal tonight. I hope it's yours too. So in the light of that, let's bow together in prayer and we'll ask for God's blessing on the reading of his word. Let's pray together. Our Lord Jesus, we turn to you now, having heard words that were written by your servant thousands of years ago. We confess to you, Lord, that as we have heard them, it seems like a strange and foreign land to us in so many different ways. And so we turn to you, Lord Jesus, and we ask you, please, to send Holy Spirit to us tonight in a very special way. May he fill every heart in this room so that we may see and hear, so that we may feel your presence, so that we may be empowered to follow this part of your holy word. We bless you and we will give you the praise as you answer this prayer. Amen. I come from Florida, and Florida is a part of the southern states of the United States. And in the deep south of the United States, if you've ever met people like that come from there, you'll understand exactly what I mean. There's sort of a process you go through when you first meet someone. It's not like what I have experienced in Asia, anywhere in Asia. And it's not like I've experienced any other part of the world. Here's how it goes. You meet someone and it's very casual at first and they say, hi, how are you? My name is such and such. And okay, so that's normal. 
And then, of course, they may ask you, well, what do you do? And so you have a sort of a superficial encounter with the person. And if you're from the outside, like I am, you're hoping that's the end of the conversation. Because what's going to happen is they're going to go deeper. And so they begin to ask questions about your family and about your friends. Well, do you know this person? Do you know that person? And you search for somebody that you know in common because that's apparently a very important thing. Ah, I know him too. It's great. Now we can be friends. But if the conversation, that initial first conversation goes on long enough, you won't believe this perhaps, but it's true. They start messing around in your life by asking you very personal questions. Well, Richard... Tell me how your marriage is. <laughs> now at that point, I'm out of the room. Because it's okay to be superficial, to look at the surface of things. You can handle that. You can go a little bit deeper with somebody into some of your friendships and those sorts of things. But when you're first meeting someone and they start asking you about your relationship with your wife or your prayer life or other things that are intimate and close to you, you want to say, Nope, I don't want to talk about that. That's, we, as we say, none of your business. Thank you very much. Very uncomfortable. The passage that we just read is a passage that does just that about the life of David, who David was. And the way it does it is it begins by giving a rather sort of superficial, easy description of him. And then it goes down a little bit deeper into who David was. And then it really gets very far right down into the heart of this King David. And it does it for a reason. The people who first received this book from the hand of God, who first received it, they were in a time when they were asking these kinds of questions. Do we really need a king? And if we have to have a king, what kind of king do we want to have? What's the right kind of king to have? And here we are in this book at the end of David's life. This is the final scene for David. It's a grand crescendo for him. And the writer of Chronicles says, this is the kind of king you must have. If you hope for the kingdom of God to flourish in this world. And so he takes them into the life of this man in this very last passage, first on the surface, then a little bit deeper, and then right down to the most personal, intimate thoughts of David's heart. So here we are tonight. A lot of us are leaders of the church. Maybe you're a pastor. And what the writer of Chronicles says about David, the way he exposes David to us, is a way of exposing you and me. Because we have to look at ourselves, not just superficially, but very deeply. And if you're not a leader of the church, an elder, a pastor, then you follow such people. And you have a responsibility to ask these kinds of questions about the people you follow. What kinds of leaders are they? Are they the kinds that the Lord wants me to follow? And of course, the Bible tells us over and over again that when you have a good leader, when you have someone who is leading the people of God and doing it well, then you should imitate what they do and how they live. Be careful with that one because you don't want to imitate everything, but the good things they do, you should emulate them. And so no matter who you are, whether you are a leader of the body of Christ, whether you are examining leaders that you're going to choose, you're in search for such a thing, maybe a new church or something along those lines, no matter who you are, if you are a follower of Jesus, this passage will open you up to examination 
just like it offered an examination of King David. Are you ready for that? Because it's only as the people of God examine themselves in these ways that we can have hope that the kingdom of God will flourish in our day as well under the leadership of our great king, and you know his name, Jesus, the son of David. So let's take a look at the first glimpse into who this king of Israel was as the people of God in ancient Israel and as the people of God today ask the question, what kind of leader do we need to see the kingdom of God flourish? It begins this way. The writer of Chronicles says, David, oh, he was so good. David was a great leader of the people of God because he was a man of practical wisdom. You saw that in the opening verses of this chapter, beginning, for example, in verse 3. He said, My son Solomon, the one whom God chose, is young and inexperienced. The task is great of building the temple because this palatial structure is not for man but for the Lord God. With all my resources, I have provided for the temple of my God gold for the gold work, silver for the silver, bronze for the bronze, iron for the iron, and wood for the wood, as well as onyx for the settings, turquoise, stones of various colors, and all kinds of fine stone and marble, all these in large quantities. That is a very wise, practical man. And if ever you thought that you could be a leader of the body of Christ, if ever you thought that actually you don't need leaders who know how to get the job done, think again. Because here is David being presented as the great leader of Israel who is handing off the kingdom to his son Solomon so he can build the temple. But basically, this is what he's saying. I have everything ready for my son Solomon. He's so inexperienced, I don't think he can handle it. So all he's going to have to do is take part A and stick it into part B and then part C and he has this prefab temple that's ready to go. That's how wise I am. That's how practical I am. And do we need that in our day today? Amen and amen. Israel needed it in the days when they first received this book because they were stumbling and suffering because their leaders, even one who was the son of David, was not able to pull things together and make things work the way they needed to work. And we today, if ever there were a time when this was true, in the turmoil and the times that we face of trials and troubles for the church of Jesus Christ around the world, we need leaders who can stand up and say, I know how to lead us into this world of trouble. Just how important is it that you become one that emulates this kind of practical wisdom? Well, I had a friend of mine who came to me one day and he said, let me tell you what happened to me. He was a grandfather. He had an 18-year-old grandson and his grandson was about to go off to the university to study but he didn't have enough money to do it. So, of course, he came to his grandfather, and you know why he came, right? He came to his grandfather to ask him, can you give me some money? And so his grandfather sat in his big chair and just sort of leaned back, and he said, okay, boy, then tell me what you're going to do with your life. What's your big plan for your life? And this 18-year-old young man said, Grandpa, I'm going to change the world. And his grandfather sat back further in the chair and he said, well, boy, when you come up with a real plan, come back and see me again. You see, enthusiasm is good. Enthusiasm for life is good. If you don't have enthusiasm even for your faith, then you're missing something that's very important. 
But the truth of the matter is that enthusiasm will not get you through the day, especially through times of trouble and times of trial, and they will not bring the kingdom of God into a time of flourishing and a time of hope and a time of blessing. Enthusiasm is important, but it's not enough. Just like that 18-year-old needed to have a plan for how he was going to do something with his life, rather than simply say, I'm going to change the whole world. Sounds like an 18-year-old, doesn't it? They actually think they're going to change the whole world. It's time for us to be like the grandfather who said, come back and talk to me when you've got the steps in mind. You know, even our great King Jesus, even our great King Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. And if you take a look at the life of Jesus, you may not ever have thought of him this way before. He was very wise in very practical ways. He knew what to do when he got tired. He always had one foot in a boat so he could get away from the crowds. He knew what to do when people were hurting. He knew what to say just at the right time in just the right way to meet the needs of the people. He knew how to out-argue the skeptics and the opponents. He even knew how to stand before Pilate, being falsely accused, and say the most clever things a person could have imagined, knowing that he was soon to go to his death. Our King Jesus was full of the spirit of wisdom. And if ever there were a time in the body of Christ when we needed leaders who have wisdom, and people who choose leaders of wisdom to follow and then emulate them in their own lives, it is in our day today. Have you ever watched Christian television? How many of you have ever watched Christian television? None of you? Really, you don't watch it? Do it tonight, would you? Because you will see there some of the craziest, most unbelievable things said by Christian leaders. And they are terribly destructive in the ways they say them, how they say them. They are the absolute opposite of what we see here in King David and what we see in our King Jesus and what I hope you see in your church leader. Wisdom. If Jesus had to grow in it, so do you and I. For all of you young people, I want to say this to you. I say often one of the biggest effects of the fall is that youth is wasted on the young and wisdom is wasted on the old. When I say that, what I mean is you who are younger, you've got all this youthful energy. I mean, you can stay up all night. You can run over here and run over there and get this done and get that done. It's so fantastic. And... But the older people in the room, including me, we watch you and we get tired just watching you do that. (laughs) But as you run and run and run, you know, I hope you know, that you often do so without much wisdom. Because wisdom, even as in Jesus' life, comes from experience. So if youth is wasted on the young and wisdom on the old because they don't have any youthfulness to get anything done, they're already asleep tonight, already asleep. Then what must we do? We must have the youth and the old together. Leaning on each other, learning from each other, joining with each other, rather than separating from each other in the body of Christ. This is the lesson that the book of Chronicles was teaching the people of Israel. And it is the lesson that the book of Chronicles is teaching us today. 
Okay, but you remember, my southern friends, don't just stay on the superficial level. I mean, you can look at someone and see whether they have practical wisdom or not. It's not that hard to see. Are they doing well at work? Are they, are they communicating well with other people? Those kinds of things. But those conversations in the deep south of the United States, you have to go a little bit deeper into who's your friend? Oh, I know that person too. Oh, he's my cousin, in fact. Oh, that's, that's taking you deeper in. And that's what the writer of Chronicles does too. He moves, from, he moves from the rather superficial display of David's wisdom to something else. And that is David leading the people of God by his example of sacrifice. His sacrificial example for them. We read this. In verses, well, let's say, in beginning in verse um, 7 or so. Let's take a look and see where that comes. Um, in verse 5, in verse 3, yeah, verse 3 it is, this is what David says. Besides in my devotion to the temple of my God, I now give my personal treasures of gold and silver for the temple of my God. Over and beyond everything I have provided for this holy temple. Then he lists off the other things that he's given. And then he turns to the crowd in verse 5, now who is willing to consecrate himself today to the Lord? Be before King David, do I, what do I need to do? Anything? Is it you or me? <laughs> do you have an idea what I should do? Take your mask down, please. He's telling me to use this. Ooh, that will be uncomfortable, but I'll do it. Okay. It is now. Was it on just now? No. To give even more than I gave. And I'm going to take it out of my own wallet. I'm going to take it out of my own personal savings. And I'm going to give in abundance. That's his example of sacrifice that he's presenting to the people that are there in the assembly with him. And he says to them, after saying this, he turns around to them and he says, who else will do it? Who else will do it? As a child, I grew up in a church where my pastor had a ceremony that he performed every time the offering was taken up. It was amazing. I still remember it so well. I must have been five or six years old when I first saw this. And this is what he would do. The deacons would have the offering plates. Do you know what an offering plate is? Something to pass around for people to put money in? Okay. But before they would pass these plates around in the congregation, they would bring, the chairman of the deacon board would bring a plate to the pastor. And the pastor would be behind the pulpit, and the deacon would come up with the plate, and he would stand there holding it like this. And the pastor would do this. You ready? Watch. He would do this. <laughs> and he would pull out of his pocket a big wad of dollar bills. And he would put them in the offering plate. <sighs> and then he'd go sit down. And you know why he did that. It was because he was leading by his own sacrificial example. I will not ask you to do anything that I have not already done. And that's precisely what Jesus did. David shows that he is not just a leader who can get practical things done. David shows more of his heart now. He's willing to sacrifice, and he's willing to do it in a way that's exemplary for others. Let me tell you about my wife. I have a friend here, Andrew, who will confirm that this is true. My wife would be the last person to ever want to go camping in a tent. If you like to camp in a tent out in the woods or up in the mountains... My wife will never go with you. I promise you, never. But one day she came home 
My wife works in a hospital, a big hospital, in the psychiatric department in Orlando, Florida. And she came home one evening and she said, I'm going to Miami. And I said, you really are? And she said, yes, I volunteered to go to Miami. To do what? She said, to live in a tent for two weeks after the next typhoon hits Miami. I said, what? Now remember, my wife hates the thought of living in a tent, but she's ready to go after the next typhoon in Miami and live there for two weeks in the heat with no air conditioning after a typhoon has destroyed much of Miami. That's the picture. You got the picture? Okay, so I looked at her and I said, how in the world did they talk you into this? And she said, I don't really know. Because she was surprised that she signed up to volunteer for this also. And so she went on to tell me, she said, well, we went to this meeting and the Red Cross was there. And the representative of the Red Cross showed all these videos of testimonies of people who had done this before. And they had tears streaming down their faces and smiles on their faces telling everyone how wonderful it is to spend two weeks in a tent after a hurricane has hit Miami. And they inspired and revved them up in that room so much that even my wife said, sign me up. I'm going to Miami. And I love the idea of living in a tent. Now, what was all that? The Red Cross is a smart organization. They understand something, that when you have a voluntary organization like the Red Cross, a charity like the Red Cross, the number one thing that leaders must do is inspire others by their examples. It is by the inspiration that you and I receive from watching our leaders live their lives that we are ready to volunteer to serve as they have served. Don't you find it very difficult to listen to your pastor tell you to do things when you're not convinced that he is already doing them in abundance? Can someone please whisper an amen to that? Inspiration is the number one role of a pastor as he preaches the word of God, as he prays for his people, as he visits his people, as he works with his people, as he works with the staff, because we are a group of volunteers. Very few of us are paid money to live our Christian life. It's a very dangerous thing to be paid money to be a Christian. Happily, you're volunteers. And what you're looking for is a leader who will inspire you to give willingly. That's what the author of Chronicles is saying to his readers. I know that the task ahead of you in trying to rebuild the temple, to get things in order in your own day, are very difficult. I understand that this is true, he says to them. But you need leaders to guide you through this. You need them to be practical, to be able to organize, to make it work. But you need much more than that. You also need them to be examples to you of sacrifice and devotion to the things of God so that you can be inspired to give willingly as well. Begin to look for that in your leaders. Begin to find out how they live their lives. Because leaders who are not exemplary in their devotion to the Lord Jesus often fall into such hypocrisy. Not always, but often fall into such hypocrisy that they become not the people who build up the kingdom of God, but the people who destroy the kingdom of God. Some of you have experienced that with a church leader, and you know how devastating it is to your life and to the lives of your children 
as they watch the church crumble because of the hypocrisy of a leader. Find a leader who lives the Christian life and follow that kind of leader. And of course, what must I say to you except the king of the body of Christ today, the head of our church, our King Jesus, he lived a life that was perfectly exemplary and sacrificial. So if you want the absolutely perfect model of what it means to live in devotion to the Father in heaven, look to the life of Jesus. How much did he give up? All of it. How much of his life did he devote to the service of God? All of it. How sacrificial was he? He sacrificed his own life for the sake of others. And it was Jesus himself who said, no greater love has any man than this, than that he lay his life down for his friends. Therefore, I tell you, love one another. All too often, we will rely on our practical skills, our practical wisdom to get us through the day, to get us into the sorts of things that we should do as Christians, be there on time, have read the chapter of the book before the Bible study, be ready to and skilled in your discussions of things, act like you're really smart and that you really know a lot. Those kinds of practical skills will rely on those things and never even ask the question, if someone knew what my life was like, would they consider me an example to follow? So the writer of Chronicles is leading the people of God in his day into a very penetrating way of assessing what kind of leaders they need. They knew they needed a son of David to lead them as their king. But that son of David had to be one of practical wisdom, and he had to be one who was willing to die for the sake of the kingdom of God. Are we... I love this passage because it doesn't simply take us from the superficial into the sort of moderately penetrating look into David's life and what kind of leader he was to be someone who could rebuild the people of God and the kingdom of God in his day. But rather, he goes so deep that it's very difficult for any of us to get around what he's saying. He goes right to the very heart of David. And what he does is he tells us very plainly how much David was a man who humbled himself in dependence on the Lord. One of the very worst things that comes upon leaders of the body of Christ today is pride. Those who are successful easily attribute their success to themselves. But that is not what David does in this passage. You know how it goes because you heard it just a few moments ago, but let's take a look at it just for a few seconds here. Beginning in verse 17. Take a look at verse 17. There David says, I know my God that you test the hearts and the heart and are pleased with integrity. All these things I have given willingly and with an honest intent. And now I have seen with joy how willingly your people who are here have given to you. O oh Lord, God of our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, keep this desire in the hearts of the peop your people forever and keep their hearts loyal to you and give my son Solomon wholehearted devotion to keep your commands and requirements and decrees 
and to do everything to build the palatial structure for which I have commanded, or which I have provided. Prior to this, listen to what David says in, oh, let's say verse 10. David praised the Lord in the presence of the whole assembly, saying, Praise be to you, O Lord, God of the Father Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Yours is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor, for everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, O Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. Wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things. In your hands are strength and power to exalt and to give strength to all. Now, our God, we give you thanks and praise your glorious name. These are the two sides of a leader who understands how dependent he is on the Lord. On the one side, when things go well, when things are accomplished, when the kingdom begins to grow, you see people in our day coming to Christ. You're able to build a building. You're able to organize. You're able to see the growth of the church. The leaders of the body of Christ will not take credit for this. What they will do is honor the Lord as the one who owns everything, knowing that nothing that they give, nothing that they do was not already given to them by the Lord. So listen carefully. When you hear leaders talk about the successes that they have in building the kingdom of God. Oh, to be sure, many of them work very hard. Many of them do. But the question that is most penetrating is this. Do they take credit for what has been done? Or do they bring to their lips repeatedly every time you come to them and say, oh, you're doing such a great job, Pastor. Do they let you know with their words, with their faces, that what is going on in the church that's good has been given to them by the Lord? and that it is not their doing. That is the kind of leader you want to have. I think we all understand that we're getting down to something that's very much at the very heart of King David. It's revealing his deepest emotions, his deepest sense of who he is as he serves the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, his great God. He knows and he says, I have given nothing that you did not already give to me beforehand. And brothers and sisters, this is the attitude our church leaders need today, and it is the attitude that every single one of us needs to have today. And that attitude needs to express itself with your lips The praise of God, the announcement to all, making it very clear that we did not do this in our power, but only in the power of God himself. That gets to the heart of what it means to be a leader who can lead the body of Christ into the flourishing of the kingdom. And was this not precisely what our King Jesus did? You would think that the one who was second person of the Trinity and who was born of the Virgin Mary, who grew up and learned wisdom so much that he had the favor of God and man, that when it was time to start his ministry, his public ministry, you would have thought that what he would do is say, okay, I got the plan, let's go do it. But that is not what our King Jesus did. As the Gospels tell us, he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. And why? Because he knew, he knew that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. He knew even the second person of the Trinity incarnated in the flesh knew that he could not lead the kingdom of God as had been ordained for him without turning to the Father and receiving his help because he needed the Father. But it is even more than that. 
when Jesus ended his time of trial and temptation, of fasting before the Lord, seeking the face of God, he came out and something happened to him. The father said, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. And then soon he was baptized. And when he was baptized, the third person of the Trinity fell upon him in the form of a dove, the Holy Spirit of God. And why? Because Jesus was demonstrating that to see the kingdom succeed, the king of Israel had to receive the power of the Spirit of God in his life. Dependence on the Trinity, dependence on the Father, and now as Christians, dependence on the Son, and then our dependence on the Holy Spirit is paramount to what it means to be a person who leads the people of God. So I ask you, where do you find your strength to serve the king? Where do you find your strength to seek to follow the ways of Christ? Is it in yourself? Or is it in the Spirit of God. Jesus told us that we would be glad when he left this earth and went away to heaven. We would be glad because he would immediately send Holy Spirit to us to empower us to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. So you and I must be the kinds of people who know how to communicate with, to struggle with, to seek after, and to receive the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Without him in your life, you are powerless to succeed in the body of Christ. Practical wisdom won't do it. Even sacrificial living won't do it. It requires dependence on the Spirit of God. But David, remarkably, does not simply say, you see how dependent I am on God because I'm now praising him for all that he has done. That's not all that he does here. He does something else that's absolutely remarkable in the passage that we just read around verse 19. He says, Lord, give my son Solomon wholehearted devotion to keep your commands, requirements, and decrees, and to do everything to build the palatial structure for which I have provided. In verse 18, he, say, he, asks, he asks the Lord to give the people a willing heart forever. What is David saying there? He's saying something that every good Christian leader and every good follower of Christ knows it's this. No matter how good things have been in the past, no matter how successful you have been in the past, no matter what ways in which God has blessed you in the past may be, whatever they may be, it can all dissipate tomorrow. I hate to tell you this, but it's so very true. Living the Christian life day by day opens you up not just to greater blessings and greater hope. It also opens you up to the possibility of failing. So what does David do knowing this? He says, look, we've had a great day today, but I need these people, Lord, to be this way forever. And also, by the way, Lord, I need you to put it into the heart of Solomon to carry forward because all my efforts will be in vain if not for Solomon carrying this building of the temple forward. And so it must be for you and me. 
we must be the kinds of people who know our dependence on the Lord so deeply, so convinced of it, that we not only thank him humbly for what he has done, but we also plead with him and entreat him to give us what we need to move forward. Maybe you've been a Christian for a very long time. Maybe you followed Jesus for a very long time and you can look back on your life and you can see, yes, God has blessed me. It's terrific. It's wonderful if you can say that about yourself. But brothers and sisters, the future is still yours. And the call of the book of Chronicles is, go to the Lord with your needs. Go to the Lord seeking his help. Go to the Lord entreating for the power of the Spirit to remain in your life and to move you forward into greater and greater successes for the kingdom. And is this not what our King Jesus himself has done? I mean, can you imagine, would you ever have imagined if you didn't know the Bible, that when Jesus died on the cross and said it was finished, that he still had things to do? I'll say that again because I don't think you got it. Would you ever have imagined, if you didn't know the Bible, that when Jesus died on the cross and said it is finished, that he still had things to do. And thank God he realized that and that he does them. And what is it that our King Jesus is doing now in the throne room of God on our behalf? He is praying for you and for me. Because the success of his kingdom still depends on entreating the Father. Isn't that amazing? And tell me, please, one of the things that Holy Spirit does that's very much like this. And it says Romans chapter 8, where he says that when the trials and the troubles come in life, that they overwhelm you because they will at times. And you don't even know what to ask for. You're not alone. Because the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will pray for you with moans and groans too deep for you even to utter. For those of you here tonight who are in training or in education for the ministry, maybe you're already a pastor and you're working the ministry and you're, and you're trying to get more education by coming to this conference and by taking the classes that are offered here, let me just encourage you this way. Learning more about the scriptures is very, very good. It gives you wisdom. It's very important. Learning how the skills of how to handle the Bible is very important. God wants you to have that kind of practical wisdom because it's only by that means that you will be able to lead by your example of a sacrificial life. But let me warn you, dear brothers, that the heart of the matter for a leader of the body of Christ is that you not only understand and believe and say it, that all that you do that's been good has come from God, but that day by day you need the Lord's blessing. So turn to him. Call out to Jesus to intercede on your behalf. 
Ask Holy Spirit to intercede on your behalf. Offering prayers that will be pleasing to God and a blessing for you. The way this chapter ends is remarkable because the writer of Chronicles is making it clear that this was great. Listen to what happens in verse 20 of this chapter, this section, at the end of this section. Then David said to the whole assembly, Praise the Lord your God. So they all praised the Lord, the God of their fathers. They bowed low, bowed low and fell prostrate before the Lord, to be sure, and the king. They knew they had the right kind of king. Brothers, sisters, we have the right kind of king. Our King Jesus. So let us bow and let us give praise to the God of heaven and earth and to his Son, our King Jesus. And the joy that will fill us and the energy that will fill us and the hope that will fill us will be unending. I love this passage because it reminds me so much of my friends in the Deep South who always start those conversations with sort of a superficial look, then a little bit deeper, and then they go right down into the personal stuff. I don't want them to. I say, stay out of my personal life. But I dare not say that to our King and our God. Let's pray together. Our Lord Jesus, we bow before you and honor you for this great, remarkable portion of your word. We prayed that Holy Spirit would come, that he would fill us so that we could hear and understand, see the things that are here in this passage. And we bless you for what has happened. We give you the praise for it. And now we turn to you, knowing that you have blessed and ask you please to write these things on our hearts that we may be your faithful followers. Fill us with the power that you had to resurrect Jesus from the dead so that we may walk in newness of life. And as you do that, we will give you the praise and we will give you the honor for it all. Amen. Well, thank you, Dr. Pratt, for uh, preaching God's word to us so faithfully calling us to wise, sacrificial, spirit-dependent, and prayerful ministry, and pointing us so clearly to Christ, the true King, who exemplified this in every way. Well, let's close uh, the, tonight's meeting with a word of prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, which we've heard tonight. We pray for the leaders from various churches who are among us tonight and for leaders of all the churches who are represented here. We pray that you endow us with practical wisdom, like the wisdom you gave David as we seek to follow Jesus. Help us to learn from each other, lean on each other, as together we seek to walk in your ways of wisdom. We pray that as David led his people in sacrifice, we would learn to lead sacrificially and so follow in the footsteps of your son who sacrificed his life to save us. We pray that you will teach us to recognize our dependence on you as David did. Cut our hearts lest we become prideful and rob you of the glory that is truly yours. Like Jesus, let us walk in dependence on you. We pray that you help us not only to look back in gratitude for your mercies to us in the past, but to call upon you for the future, knowing that it's only by your grace that we can move forward in a way that pleases you. 
And we thank you that as we do that, we can do so with confidence, knowing that we have a great high priest who is praying for us. And so help us, Father, like David, to be leaders that point to your Son. And help us to follow leaders like that, even as we love and follow and bow before him. We ask this in his name. Amen. Amen.